I'm delighted to introduce you to Nicole Delma and Beth Josephs. And yes. Yay. And what I'm sure you've all read Salt or some sort of book like that that focuses on something that makes you think about the whole world and commerce and how things are put together and relate to each other. And to have people who are so knowledgeable about, about fabrics and the things that we take for granted, which are all woven, let's face it. I mean, it's by and large, I think I'm not saying that incorrectly. Um, to have two people that are so impassionately involved in their, in their craft, in their knowledge of their craft, and have a longstanding dedication to it, I think is going to be fascinating. And I have like a zillion questions, and I'm sure you will too. And our format for this is conversational. It's not, um, it's not really uh, stiff for... They're both going to present briefly before we get into a conversation, but... We want you to feel comfortable about getting excited about wanting to know something and raising your hand and asking. So without further ado, oh, I'm sorry, we're going to begin with Nicole Delma, and this is Beth Josephs. Thank you, April, and hello, everyone. Um, as April said, feel free to interrupt, raise your hand, ask questions. Um, so uh, Nicole Delma, and I am the founder of a little venture called Mind Offline, which you may or may not have driven by. Um, we now have a physical space that's up the street on the corner of Germain and 114. Um, and I can get a little bit further into that that journey into what Mind Offline was. It, it really was uh, uh, something that was formed out of necessity during at the beginning of COVID. Um, I have my children here who are now five and seven, but at the time were two and three, and um, they were attending uh, the Ross School up the street, and we were told when you know everything shut down that they were going to go online. <laughs> we uh, very quickly realized that was that was not feasible, and so we started to look. Um, and I should mention that because we were actually boarding parents, we decided to shelter at my office, which is above where Bagel Buoy is at down on Bay Street, and now where um, Chris's is going in. And so we had mommy's art supplies in that space, but not the traditional children's art supplies in that space. So Mind Offline um, began there sort of as a, a community venture where we were creating ceramic kits and then eventually knitting kits and natural dye kits that we were delivering and picking up and having fired for people at the start of COVID. Um, and then one thing led to another and we did a pop-up and, and then another pop-up and then we ended up with this, this permanent space up the street. So. Um, that that's sort of the the basis of where local wool company which is the the core focus right now i would say of mind offline really began um and so i'd love to talk to you guys a little bit more about that journey um and how i ended up in wool and knitting again when um you know my my history before that my parents were in the clothing industry and i grew up very much underneath a rack and hearing about fabrics and repeatedly being told never to go into that industry and have nothing to do with it. And um, and so I was always hearing them discuss fiber and quality and uh, these different aspects and, and color and the colors weren't consistent in production. Um, but it was something that I never envisioned as, as being part of my life in any way. So I actually worked for the last uh, couple decades uh, in, in media and database and coding, and um, there's a crossover there where I realized at a certain point that knitting is coding um, and, it, and many other things, but we'll, we'll circle back on that. Um, so I, I like to say that my journey back to making awakened my soul. Um, interestingly, I personally was, was very involved in handwork. I did nonstop made bracelets and made jewelry and was down selling them at the, the Pike Place Market as a, a 10-year-old child. Um, and it was very much the way that I passed time and made sense of the world, a world that would, you know, was often confusing to me. I didn't understand when um, you know, there was uh, conflict in the, the Middle East or, or things that were, were affecting me in my earlier years. And so making was always something that I did uh, to pacify myself. And I interestingly attended um, a high school that was funded by Bill Gates, and we were part of the first sort of uh, experiment program that um, asked us to go or 
I don't, I don't remember being asked, but we were all put on the internet overnight. And so overnight we were, books and paper and writing were taken away from us. And almost simultaneously I stopped making. So with the introduction of the online, I stopped playing music, I stopped creating artwork, I stopped all of those different, different aspects of um, my own sort of free time. And I don't know if there's causation or just correlation there because it was also teen years. And I know teens uh, changed through a lot of things, but uh, when the world stopped and I had to get offline at the beginning of COVID, suddenly this urge to make came back and I was, um, you know, thinking in color again and waking up with visions of, of things that I wanted to create, even if I didn't necessarily know how to create them. Um, so during, during the cu first couple of months of COVID, I was seeking out wool um, and supply and, you know, demand were very much interrupted and I couldn't find the wool that I wanted. And so I had uh, remembered a conversation with a professor at Parsons named Laura Sansome, who runs something called the New York Textile Lab where she's been pushing for years to educate people on the quality of New York wool. And I thought, wait, there's, there's wool in New York? It was almost as shocking as when I found out there was surfing in New York, and that, that's how I ended up, up out here and with my kids and everything else was surfing. Um, but I, I thought, I, I can't believe this. I've never heard that you know, anybody's producing wool, or I'd only known of New Zealand wool and Italian wool and you know, imported cashmere. And so she said, oh no, there's a whole, whole network. And she connected me to Browder's Birds, which is up in Manitouk. And um, any one of you can go up and visit and meet the sheep. They have a herd of about 40 Cotswold sheep. Um, and I think the next shearing is actually on the fourth or fifth, if you're curious to go up and skirt wool. It's not, not glamorous, but it is a very interesting part of the process. Um, and after... And uh, learning a little bit more about skirting the wool uh, and having a chance to talk to the farmers, um, it became apparent to me that there was a bigger uh, educational need out here. So similar to what perhaps went on with Long Island uh, wine, and it took you know a decade or more to educate people on the fact that we could go grow good wine out here, uh, I, I sort of at that time locked in my brain this um, passion where I thought, I, I want other people to know about this. And um, I'm not you know, a strong vegan or anything in that respect, but another really compelling aspect of why this was important was because the farmers were not making enough on the fleece to be able to sustain these animal farms. And so what that meant for, for their livestock was that the livestock would, would need to be processed for meat uh, because the fiber itself was not driving enough revenue for the farm. Um, and in many cases on Long Island, um, alpaca, um, merino, uh, Cotswold, the, the fiber is simply being dumped. And you know, it's getting mixed in with the compost. And uh, as someone that, that values you know, fleece and, and fiber, as I know many of us do, I, I couldn't reconcile this fact. Um, and so I, I'm actually working now on a project to figure out what we could do with sort of like the lesser quality wool, because you can use it to um, we actually have two duvets at home or, or comforters that are filled with wool and we have mattress toppers that are, are covered with wool and there's other applications where, where the sort of the, the second cuts can be used and so there's even less waste. But um, I, I like to say that um, that was sort of the, the backstory behind why I got so deep into this process was I, I connected with the animals. This here is one of our, our baby angoras, which I'll, I'll get further into. Um, and then on the left here is, that's the uh, Catskill Merino, and I have a tendency, as anyone in our knitting circle knows, I, I just do these really simple sequence stitches, and they're actually um, algorithms. And so many of them are in cycles of six, and they result in very different, uh, sometimes elaborate, sometimes not as so elaborate patterns. But for me, um, the, the process of working with my hands was the most successful way that I could ever find to realize what people were talking about when they were talking about meditation, because all of my efforts to meditate were unsuccessful. This idea that you could sit and observe a thought and not react to it. But when uh, holding you know, my needles in my hand and the fiber, I don't, it, it's like having a magic wand. I can, the, you know, what the chaos can be happening around me. I could be in an airport or you, you know, toys can be flying over my head and I'm able to sit and observe these thoughts because there's some other part of my brain and I know that there's 
a lot of research to support um, the therapeutic benefits of knitting, the, um, not just from anxiety and stress reduction, but in, in terms of supporting people's recovery from PTSD, from addiction. Um, and I didn't learn about all of these things until afterwards, but I experienced them firsthand. And so I, I know for any of us that do a lot of handwork, they can relate in, in a different way. It's not, it's sort of a positive addiction, but also something that um, allows you to go into that space where you're not reactionary all the time, but, but just sort of enjoying the space and enjoying what, what comes and, and letting it go. Um, so this is a, a little intro to our, our store here up the street, if you've um, driven by, the most common comment I get is, oh, I've been meaning to stop, and I don't, I don't take any offense to that because for eight years I drove by and never stopped there and thought that's an interesting space. I should take a meditation class there or I should check out that, that artist's work, and um, I never stopped until it, it, all of these different things aligned and, and the space was, it seemed, seemed to be meant for me because I had actually contacted the landlord about another space, and he said, well, you know, this one is available. Um, and I like to say that Mind Offline was a response to the Earth's directive. Um, and what I mean by that is that when, when COVID hit, and it, for some reason for me it wasn't, it didn't feel like a shock. Certainly as a mother, there were emotions and being separated from my own family and as a boarding parent for 18s that we had to figure out how they were going to get home to their various places around the world, there, there were stressors and there were, um, you know, there was a lot of unexpected uh, just, you know, emotions and conditions, but I didn't feel shocked by it. It almost felt like, well, what, what did we expect in some ways? Um, and I, I don't want to go too deeply into that conversation, but where that came from was that I was very deeply involved in packaging reform at the time. And that was actually why I was at Parsons to begin with, as I was working on uh, a documentary with the, the filmmakers that made the film about Flint's water quality on asking questions about why the U.S. is so far behind in our packaging, especially our e-commerce packaging, which um, for Amazon alone, they're shipping upwards of 15 billion packages a year. And as we've all experienced, it's very hard to avoid Amazon. And out here on Long Island, there's not, not a lot of place to, to take you know, that, that waste. And um, so I had started a petition asking for, for some reform in uh, e-commerce shipping options, just, so just a button. And we got up to close to a million signatures. And so I was very, very involved at that time. And it, it just felt like when, when this sort of call to slow down hit, um, my immediate thought was like, this is the earth telling us to stop. And for me to start making, to get back into be connected to the things I was consuming and how they were produced. Um, and then the third part of that was to remember and remember who I ultimately was before this online, fast-paced, internet-driven, chaotic world um, was either introduced to me or imposed upon me, depending on how you want to think about it. So uh, that, that was how Mind Offline started, and Mind Offline has evolved tremendously. Um, I like to say that Animals and children very much led the way. Um, my own children, you'll see Indigo there and uh, Georgica were very much a part of the process because as we were beginning all of the different materials, um, I noticed, especially for children, adults as well, that the more organic, the higher quality, the raw, more raw materials, the, the longer they were engaged. So when they were they got into you know, my Japanese watercolors, which were normally hidden from them. They painted for three hours, and the output was so much more remarkable than the typical um, paints that children are given in this very limited palette. So um, there was that combination, and the children came with me to visit the various farms. Um, so on the left are the Cotswold, which are a protected heritage breed, um, which is a very, uh, a whole other aspect of uh, fiber production, which I was completely unaware of. So similar to what happened with production of food and GMO and homogenization, um, and this happened both in the cotton industries as well as with, with wool and, and others. And one of the reasons alpaca were phased out is that clothing companies started to demand so much consistency in their product and so much scale that um, certain breeds like Merino were just pushed and pushed and pushed. And so where you would go into a department store and how many different types of wool would you see? It got, got to the point where you would see generally um, cashmere, Merino, 
and not much else. You, you didn't get an option for a Cotswold sweater. Um, and Americans especially started to feel that those fibers were itchy. In fact, um, you know, I don't find them itchy at all. I find them quite pleasant, but it's an, interestingly, they, they are a breed that does very well um, you know, in colder, rainier climates, so in Ireland and England, Scotland, and those were our, our top first customers for, for the sweaters that were made out of those fibers. Um, the fiber is incredibly uh, antimicrobial. It, it will last longer than you. <laughs> I like to say when people look at, at one of the pieces, um, we will always I'll hold up a vintage piece made of the same fiber, and it looks pretty great for, for a sweater that's over 100 years old. Um, so there's, there's certain qualities of each of these fibers that we tried to work with um, in the same way that um, a chef might work with the, the produce that's available seasonally. We tried to focus um, with local wool company on the unique qualities of the different fibers. Um, and then on the right, we've got the Catskill Merino, which actually, in, in terms of um, the fineness of fiber, is softer than the cashmere. Uh, and I often will, will have people come into the store, and uh, I have, I'm really grateful to have a, an artist here tonight that works with the same fiber that was like a miracle to, to meet with, and I'll share her work in a little bit. But um, yeah, these, these sheep have a remarkable story, and the lamb's wool is, most knitters that knit with it say it's like butter, so it's my favorite to work with. And if you're accustomed to cashmere, I highly encourage you to try. Um, Catskill Merino. Um, I, I got into a bidding war early on during lockdown because I found out that Oscar de Laurento was doing all of his samples with her fiber and I was buying it at that time 10 skeins at a time or 12 and I very quickly said you know I think I think I'll take a thousand and that's how this all began you know and I didn't have a plan for it but I thought lockdown might go on for 10 years and I didn't want to run out of wool and um, the kids might remember very quickly our space was was filling up and in any given weekend I might Sometimes I would dye, you know, 300 skeins in one weekend and have all of these different rainbows of colors, and it, it smelled a little like a barn, and it still does <laughs> a bit. There's wool in, in every room of the house. But, um, so this was, it was just another aspect of local wool that uh, I would encourage everyone to dig a little further into. There's a wonderful group called the Livestock Conservancy whose um, sole mission is to preserve diversity uh, within the species that we have here. It's not... It's not good for our planet, it's not good for the animals to have only one type of merino sheep. And we, we've gone very far towards only having a couple different breeds. Um, and it would be a good time to start investing in and focusing on some of these other uh, fibers and getting used to some different uh, textures as well. Um, this is the very beginning of our knitting circle. I recognize a few folks that are here tonight. Um, and the, the knitting circle has since moved to the church because it's grown so big and the church has very much welcomed it and Beth uh, Josephs is leading it here. And I, I think it sometimes is so big that we have to tell people they can't join or something. I said <laughs> we're, no to anybody, yes. Good, that, that's amazing. So it started with just a few of us here. And um, for me, it, it actually introduced me to a whole other Sag Harbor that there um, there were all of these wonderful artists, former artists, um, makers that stepped away or were actively making that just sort of came out of the woodwork. And I think this was still during a time when the village hadn't approved our signage. So people would see wool in the window and kind of poke their heads in and say, I heard, I heard you have knitting here. And then it was like a, a secret code where, where they would come in and, you know, I, I know this is what you've got, but show me where the good wool is. And like, I go in the back and get the other wool. Um, but it, and I, I like to say that it helped us to start establishing these, these rhythms during a time of utter chaos that we had our knitting circle on Wednesdays and sometimes a couple times a week. And for many of us, we really looked forward to that time. And um, for, I would say we were pretty successful at not talking about politics or religion. <laughs> we just talked about our projects and how our families were and who was having a grandchild or, or, or family visiting. And um, I learned a lot because I'm still, I always say I'm not a great knitter. I'm, I'm just a very passionate knitter. Um, and then, you know, finally, I, I would say it, um, socializing in earnest. So after so many years of so many functions and, and getting together for events because you felt like you should be at the events or, or shouldn't miss them, we were all there because we really wanted to be there. And um, that, that was just such a refreshing feeling and something that I hadn't experienced in a really long time. Um, and I would say pulled, pulled us through some of those, you know, 
more uncertain times when things were closing or not closing, and um, we were dreading the colder weather as we got into that season, and there was some times when, when we weren't able to meet, but then we would still share via text our different projects, and the, the text chain still is very active. I think there's about 10 to 20 texts that come through a day through the knitting circle. Um, but I uh, just wanted to touch quickly on, on local wool and what I'm defining that as, uh, because my goal for local wool, it's not, it's not a business that will ever have huge margins, and that's by design. Um, I look a lot to Yvonne Chouinard and Ben and Jerry as uh, you know, good, good business models where uh, you know, if you go into it just for the profit, it's probably not going to be very close to the mission that you're, you're seeking. So we're, we're operating, we're not a 501c3, but we're okay if we don't make a profit right now. Um, our goal is to teach others how, and, and there are ways that you can make this um, process sustainable. And both financially and um, ecologically. So we are growing, uh, milling, and producing, having the sweaters knit uh, within 300 miles of here, so 287 miles. So we get to see how the animals are cared for, we get to see how the mill is operating and it treats its employees, and then we're able to avoid all kinds of shipping waste that would typically happen in the production of a knit garment. Um, for those of you that haven't been close to the clothing industry, Usually the, the wool comes from one country and then the wool is sent to another country to be milled, sometimes on a boat, um, can take months, lots of plastic is involved, is sent to another country for um, dyeing and there's a lot of waste in that process and then it's sent to another country for the finishing um, and possibly even then another one for the tagging and bagging before it gets here. So a, a simple sweater that you might buy at an average store in town has probably been around the globe a few times. Um, and the margins are not justified in, you know, in terms of that markup because most of the people involved in that process were not paid nearly a fair wage. So we, um, we want to stay really focused on the fact that we feel really good about um, how everyone is being compensated. And um, so the price points are, are not for everyone, but they're, they're definitely still you know, competitive with the other, other businesses that you might come in contact with out here. Um, and we, we do feel that the garments will last longer and we can tell a better story. Um, this is the, the mill that we went to visit for the first time. I'd never been to a mill. They had to bring this entire room of machinery over from India because um, the U.S. really only has two operable mills at scale. We sold off most of this equipment when we uh, moved over to synthetic several years ago. So even Woolrich and some of the other big ones no longer process their wool in the United States, which has been very devastating for the milling industry. It's my dream to be able to revive a mill and, and run one, but I, I know very little about it. <laughs> um, so this is, a, this is a Holly Browder, who has been a real inspiration. So Holly is the shepherdess of the Cotswold Merino, and again, she's up in Mattituck, and you can go meet her flock, and she does a really great uh, informational tour and uh, they also do processed chickens, and she's been working um, really hard, and I'm trying to help her to raise the profile of local fiber so that she can stop processing chickens and just work on education and uh, focus on the fiber and get away from, from the meat. Um, I was laughing with April earlier. This is the first day that we brought um, the, the sweaters that I knit, so I'm an okay knitter, I'm not a great knitter, and all of the sleeves were about three inches too long <laughs> for, for anybody, so I don't know if anyone can notice that in this. So um, I, I do my best to knit the first samples, and then I work with uh, expert knitters that work with other designers in New York to refine them and, and make them more standardized to fit um, someone that doesn't have exceptionally long arms <laughs> in this case. I so. was thinking they look really kind of hip. I was kind of thinking, yeah, I get that one on the left in that picture. <laughs> it's, you know, it could work. Um, and yeah, but there's a, maybe, there, maybe in a couple, couple years, but at the stage that my kids are at, I couldn't do these sleeves. It would be, um, you know, a little bit too much, but it, there, there's probably someone that could pull it off. Um, and similarly, this is a kind of a funny story. So Isabella Rossellini, who has been a further huge inspiration and someone that I've admired for many years, called up one day and said, oh, I hear you do local wool. Can we co come by? And I thought, the first thing I thought is, oh, we better clean up. You know, we, we got everything very organized. And she, she was so lovely um, and very, very down to earth and has her own farm in Brookhaven. And she has sort of six mismatched sheep there. But I heard she just bought 200 goats. And so she's getting much more into the fiber. 
um, business and we came together with six other women that were involved with fiber in New York and we now have a Long Island wool that's been developed and we're working with a professional designer, uh, Eileen Camp, to develop some pieces that, uh, so we, we realized that probably the most viable way to drive local wool forward, aside from sort of our, our storefront and trying to educate people, is to work with established designers or emergent designers who already have people that appreciate their designs and to encourage them to work with these local wools instead of trying to turn this local wool into high fashion. This is, you know, I, I stick with more traditional shapes. Um, and ironically, the Isabella sweater is the one that she grabbed was far from, far from being finished in terms of development. So I, I sort of shuddered when she grabbed it and wanted to buy it, but it looks great on her. So what was I going to say? <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, that, just a little, a couple other tidbits about my fiber journey um, before I pass it over to Beth. These are the Angora rabbits. We have giant Angora rabbits, which um, really showed up in our house because I went up to the Sheep and Wool Festival in Rhinebeck, which I highly encourage everyone that likes fiber to go to. You might go a little crazy. I'm glad that I, I only brought one Suburban, which we completely filled with wool and then rabbits, um, who proceeded to have babies <laughs> four weeks after we bought them uh, in our bedroom because my mom was visiting at the time. Um, and so they get to about 15 pounds and their fiber can be harvested and very humanely, it just, you just sort of pluck it. Um, and they're often up at the shop, so if you ever wanna come and see the, the uh, rabbits, you're welcome to come visit the rabbits. Um, and we're doing a, a collection that will feature some of their fiber as well as Brookhaven Angora fiber um, coming up next month. Then on the right is a, a shot um, that is at uh, Perfect Earth, and this was uh, some of the dye plants that we were growing, and Catherine Wedgbury, who's up in the front row, was actually the, the gardener that helped tend to all of these plants and helped keep them alive in, in a way that I would not have been able to, and uh, so we had a really great indigo harvest and, and some other plants. So a lot of the colors that we use, you can easily grow in your backyard or find and forage locally. Um, and then, I uh, just want to share quickly, so Madeline Porterfield, who's, who's here with us tonight, is um, the designer that I mentioned who, um, these were all her concepts, came entirely from her imagination, but uh, resonated so much with me when I found them, because not only is she working with my favorite fiber, but she's, she's doing some of these repetitions and deep texture and sequin stitches and using the undyed wool, which is basically what I dream about, and so to stumble across her um, we ended up uh, acquiring her entire first collection, which you'll see here, and it's now in our store um, up the street. So if you want to see some really imaginative and remarkable knitting that's been done with local wool, I, I encourage you to stop by, and I think she'll be in town for a bit tomorrow if you have any questions. And um, so we'll be doing custom orders with, with Madeline's work as well. So very excited about that. Um, and then just a couple other notes. This, uh, as I talked about, just learning about fiber on the left, what you see is what's called color-grown cotton. So similar to what happened in the sheep and wool industry, this homogenization of we, we need everything to be consistent, it needs to fit in the mill the same way, it needs to be exactly the same season after season. That's also what happened with cotton, and that's why we associate cotton with being white. Cotton comes in a whole variety of beautiful shades, but those shades got phased out because at mass production, they were not uh, the, the colors that mills wanted. They couldn't produce consistent color. So we work with a brand called Wallhide that has been really raising the education around color-grown cotton, which is in all these amazing earth tones, and have sweaters in the store now, um, like the, the ones that you see on the right that uh, feature this color-grown cotton, which will never fade because that's the color it was grown. Um, so that, that's essentially us, local wool. Um, we uh, are, uh, this winter, I think we're gonna be open mostly on Saturday and Sunday and by appointment, um, but I'm often in the back working and we will again be taking part in the, the maker market that the church hosted last year, which was phenomenal. So we hope to see you up at the store or um, feel free to shoot us an email if you have any questions or wanna be in touch with any of these local wool producers. Um, thank you so much, April, for inviting us. I really appreciate it. It's an honor. 
and for hosting uh, the Knitting Circle. We've really enjoyed being here. I have a BFA in textile arts from California College of Arts and Crafts, now known as California College of Art. Uh, concentration was in weaving. This is um, an embroidered self-portrait I made, um, not completely finished, and the hair uh, is done with the technique known as applique. This is a weaving I did. It, it, I brought it here also. Um, it's double weave technique uh, so that the warp, there's two warps, and one of them is dyed with the Japanese ikat technique so that the cows are shown on one side in the, the dyed ikat warp, the brown and white, and when you flip it over, you get the negative, um, so you see the cows dyed the cows woven in the uh, other warp, which is black. Baby, can you explain how that shift happened? The shift in the whitish color is from the tension of the warp on the loom. So the threads can, can are pulled. Just, just say a little bit about warp and weft, and the, sure. just if you okay. can reduce it without you know, insulting it sure, <laughs> in sure. this complexity. The warp simply are the threads that go this way and the weft is what's going horizontally, what you weave. The, the warp is what's threaded on the loom, and the warp is what you pass through um, to make the, your design. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay. So as part of it, uh, when does the dyeing happen? The dyeing, it's the, the threads are dyed before it's even put on the loom. So the threads are dyed as the warp, before it's warped onto the loom, before it's put on the loom. And when you say there's a double warp process, double warp, yeah. so are there two vertical, um, there's two yeah. setups yeah. that are vertical, and then you would work in like within both of them, and, and does the weft leave, weave them together, essentially? Yes, so you have um, two warps, meaning it's threaded so that they are alternating threads. And when you are sitting at it, you see one surface. In this case, uh, the black was facing me, and I picked up the threads that were below, up from the warp below with, um, you can use a stick or you can use your shuttle or a bobbin. And um, I picked up the threads from below just to make the outline of the cows that I had, I had drawn. I had previously blocked it out on graph paper, so I knew exactly how many threads um, I was counting out for the outline of the cows. Like how many threads for a hoof, how many threads for a horn. And um, the shuttle is the thing that goes th your, horizontally through? Your weft yarn is woven, is just wound on a shuttle, and that's mm -hmm. what passes through horizontally. Yeah. yeah. How Sorry, it's hard. The white was the original color of the yarn, okay. and I dyed um, brown around it so that it's, it's a resist. So there was something on the white that So was it's tied off. off. Yeah, it's tied okay. off. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there surprises? Yeah, there can be. There can be, yeah. But this was exactly how I envisioned it, so I was very happy with the result. It took me a while to see the cows there. Yeah? Well, they're there over there. <laughs> and the other side is the other side. Yeah. The other side, the cows are in black. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it is a much more complex thing when you're hearing about it. It's for you, it's describe. so easy to say, well, it is only two hours. Yeah. But for the general public, because I we're know. so far away yeah. from the way the things that we use and wear and depend on and, and take for granted yeah. are created, it's, it's fascinating to me to hear about the possibility of there being a 
two layers that you can work yeah. with to get more subtlety, Maybe more one complexity. Day I could demonstrate it here. I think you could. <laughs> I think there might even be a workshop, possibly, yeah. in all of this. And ikat, uh, the Japanese technique, it, maybe it's familiar to people, is uh, on kimonos. That's um, a design that you can see that has that kind of striated look in the dye. It looks kind of brushy dye. almost. It has yeah. a very nice kind of quality. Did you did you want to ask a question? Oh, sorry. For example, I would just have to guesstimate. I don't, you know how when you're working, you don't keep track of the time. And no. Yeah. That's why it's so small. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it takes a long time. I, this was really an exercise for me. I, I was very happy with the way it turned out, but of course, you know, you're never sure how it's going to turn out when you're weaving and trying new, new things. But that's part of the excitement and the love of it, too. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it, one of my housemates was a photography major, and um, he took this uh, portrait of me. And I, um, for a project, I decided to blow it up and to cut it and weave it. <clears throat> Some close-ups. This was a garment that I wove, kind of jumper. What's the material? It's wool. It's all wool. Yeah, long time ago. I also um, experimented with the tapestry weaving technique. So uh, for those that don't know, tapestry weaving is where you actually uh, kind of paint with the yarn. That's what it's been uh, you know, uh, compared to. Um, this was a, from a drawing that I did in life drawing class. And I used the drawing as a template under the warp. So the, I left the warp hanging down just for effect, but you can see clearly those are the vertical threads. And then um, I used different yarns to get the effect of the, the charcoal drawing I had done in class using the drawing as a template underneath. So I could see through the outline and I could part the warp weaves and see where I was going, the warp thread, sorry. Um, and then I cut it off the loom and trimmed most of the warp and just left what was hanging on the bottom. So it was done as a, as a big rectangular piece. Yeah. And then after you were done, it was roughly cut around yeah. and then those, those threads were tied in behind. They're woven in yeah. like with a needle in behind, yeah. And, I'm sorry? Um, I don't know what you mean by algorithm, but the cows I had specifically drawn out on graph paper, so I knew exactly how many threads per square on the graph, yeah. This was, this is another tapestry done, um, this is my brother Dan, <laughs> um, who's here, um, and this is not that specific, it's just using the, the weft yarn, the different colors that are going this way, as I said, uh, what you could call painting with the yarn. This, I also um, did some painting with dye on fabric. Uh, this, the assignment was to paint something that was very close to you. So this is three scenes of my bed in disarray, <laughs> how it usually was. On the left is, um, you can see this blanket that's in red with yellow in the center and green. Those are granny squares, which is a style of crochet that was very popular. I crocheted that as a senior in high school, a, blan a blanket that I made then. This 
this was entered into a juried show at Guildhall. It was accepted and it won an award. Okay. <laughs> what? What is the size? Um, it's large. Yeah. It's big. It's probably 84 inches wide. You know a little bit better than me. Uh, I remember like five, five feet it on home, tall. So it yeah. Rain. It's mounted, yeah, and, uh, there. Yeah, it's, it's a big piece. Yeah. 60, uh, yeah. Is it quilted? Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> then I quilted it by hand. Uh, outline all the, the uh, blankets and pillows. And the trim, it was added on also by hand. Yeah. Um, after college, I studied textile conservation through the Bethpage Village Restoration and uh, the Textile Conservation Workshop, which is in South Salem, New York. I was hired by the East Hampton Historical Society to catalog the textile collection at Clinton Academy. That's me in the middle with two other uh, gentlemen helping me to dismantle an antique loom that the Clinton Academy has. It was on the ground floor and we're painting every joint and numbering every joint so that it could theoretically be reassembled in the future someday. Uh, the photograph was used by NYU for um, a brochure for one of their programs, but that's at Clinton Academy in East Hampton. Uh, I then worked for a few more historical societies and then for a gallery in Manhattan called Art Weave. It was near the Met. And they dealt with mostly ancient Coptic textiles and some antique um, Kilim rugs. This is a fragment of a Coptic that I was given when I left. <laughs> <laughs> the day job. <laughs> This is when medicine became very interesting to me as a study. It became my future career. Um, uh, I was an EMT and then a paramedic in New York, in Manhattan. And we enjoyed having an all-female crew for a while. And on the left is Lucy Winton, who is an artist and has a piece in this show upstairs. Who's sitting right there? <laughs> Yay, Lucy. We've known each other a long time, happily. Jumping uh, ahead, I uh, have always knitted, and especially um, when I got involved with my medical career, knitting is very portable, and I always had it with me in the ambulance, as Lucy reminded me, <laughs> and um, in class. This is a sweater that um, I made using the technique called steaking, which was developed in the Shetland Islands. It's um, where the knitting is done completely in the round. So you knit a tube, essentially, for the body. And then you cut, you cut it up the middle to make a cardigan. And the reason that this was done widely in Scandinavia was because it's just much more efficient. All knitters prefer to knit. Um, with the stitch that's called the knit stitch, bringing you around and around in a circle. It's quicker, it's more efficient, and um, that's how it's commonly done there. So I was interested in this technique. I tried it out. This, that sweater is here too. And this is another sweater that I steeped uh, to make a cardigan. Got some whale buttons as a nod to Sag Harbor. Mm -hmm. So you finish the edges and knit the button band and attach the buttons, and then you have your card again. Do you have to leave like a loose panel that you can cut into? Do you plan that so that when you, when you cut it to add a border, it's easy to stitch into it? Yeah. Actually, the steek is apparently a word that also means a kind of bridge. Um, so you act. In this one, I really didn't. I just kind of winged it. But in this one, it's hard to tell, but 
you knit some extra stitches, like mm -hmm. about one inch worth of extra stitches that um, is your, your guideline to where you're going to cut. It would be yeah. so shocking to knit something and then cut it. I just yeah. can't imagine yeah. having knitted scarves when I was little. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, everybody feels that way at first, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing a lot of bundle dyeing, which is where you um, apply the dye products to the yarn or fabric. So on the left is um, the dye products I placed on a, a background fabric. At the top is um, red onion skins, then uh, avocado stones, avocado skins, uh, black tea, annatto seeds, and some hib dried hibiscus blossoms on the bottom. Place the skein of yarn over it. Place more of the dye product over that. It's then bound up and wound very, uh, very tightly, bound with rubber bands or string, and it's placed in a steamer for an hour or two. And when you unwrap it, this is just the uh, fabric that it was wrapped in, which I thought was really beautiful in itself you get um, all different kinds of results. And this is the one I got with that, uh, sort of a variegated yarn um, that looked really interesting, wound up in the skeins as well, which are on the right. They're called cakes, how, actually. How fugitive is the color of the Most of the products that I use are not fugitive. Um, hibiscus is very fugitive, I knew that, but the the, uh, other reason that they're not fugitive is because um, you treat the fabric, you treat the yarn in this case, with a mordant. And a mordant is a, um, a product, usually it's a, a type of aluminum, depending if you're using uh, protein or cellulose fabrics. Um, it causes a chemical reaction, so the product binds chemically to the, the fiber. Uh, some more examples of yarn that was dyed. The red onion skin gives a surprising kind of, kind of neon uh, yellow, which is really cool. Avocado, usually you get a pinkish hue, but I never do. <laughs> I think it's my water. Hence the hibiscus, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, bird's eye view, some dye pots, hibiscus, and these are um, purple bearded iris from my garden on the right which is uh, bundled up and steamed, gave me this yarn on the right, hibiscus on the top, and the purple iris gives this beautiful bluish green. Is this just a regular, was the steamer, you just steam it in a wok, is it? Or no, I have, a, I have a, bit, a tall stainless steel pot, and I did use a regular kitchen steamer. You can use anything just to support it. That, that the, uh, what are you wearing and the ones behind you, are they done with this material? Uh, yeah, I'm getting there. Um, okay. This one and this one, these two are. Yeah. Right. And the photos are not as vibrant as they are in yeah. real life, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Was yeah. <coughs> this is a blanket I knitted for my son and it uses a lot of the products that I just, uh, a lot of the uh, yarn I just showed you that I had dyed. Um, indigo, which is really fun. You don't need to mordant. It's very uh, extremely um, tough stuff. Um, this is my daughter Emily who scrunched up that t-shirt and tied it up and threw it in the dye bath and you always get really surprising beautiful results. These are yarns that I dyed with the indigo um, and the second from the bottom you can see a little bit of white where I tied it off with string in uh, just at different places along the entire skein so it resisted the indigo. Beth is there like a resist that's ever used with indigo dyeing or is it just about bundling and tying so you that do it, it doesn't any, get there? There's many many uh, different kinds of resists. Bundling and tying is one of them. Yeah bundling tying is one of them. Um, this indigo we bought online. It comes in a powder form. And if you had but, bought it from yeah, your source? Nicole and Catherine were growing it last year. I tried to I buy some. It. 
I know. I tried to buy. I had a girl. <laughs> when I when I. I have more seeds. When I called you to, I said I'm ready to buy the plants, and you said they're dead. I'll give you some of the seeds. Okay. Yeah, there's okay. a great group in uh, Maryland called Blue Light Junction that has a whole right. indigo revival project. Oh. Okay. Um, great. Yeah. Yeah. It's such an extraordinary color. I feel yeah, like I'm just it's amazing. I'm just like luxuriating in the colors that you're showing. Oh, Both good. of you, it's just been so and delicious. And fresh indigo, if you use the fresh leaves, you get a bluish green, uh, like aqua, like Caribbean. So these, blue. this is leaves. This is a plant whose leaves produce this color, not flowers right, from a plant. Right, right. It's the leaves. That's remarkable. But the powder is is processed. It's there's a whole um, system to get it to the powder form, and then you get this amazing blue. Which, interestingly, I don't have photographs of it, but when you take your product out of the dye bath, it's bright green. Mm -hmm. And as it oxidizes, what? it becomes blue. Yeah. That's amazing. Dyeing is really fun, yeah, <laughs> for everyone, right. These are three sweaters I knit with the indigo yarn that I dyed. On the left is um, a linen cotton blend. I dyed it very uh, sparingly, as you can see. The center, it's also here on the wall behind me, is the uh, yarn, the skein that I had tied off with string, and it ge gives this kind of starry night effect. And on the right, it was um, with a skein that I kept, success I kept dipping. So the first dip um, is light, and then as you dip again, it becomes more intense. If you leave sections out, you get the variegated, so light, a little darker, and, and much darker. And that's why this indigo and this sweater is uh, different shades, if that's, if that's clear. I don't know if that's clear. Uh, these are carrot and radish tops. Black tea, um, beautiful brown when the, the first dip where the color is really intense. And then as successive dips of yarn are done, you exhaust, it's called exhausting the color. So you get a much lighter effect. So that in that case, you'd use, you would dye a skein using the fresh dye, mm -hmm. and then you would put a separate skein in right. the more exhausted dye, yeah. and then it would produce that I color. Love, exactly. love those colors. Yeah. So you can just keep dipping different skeins and you get it comes out lighter and lighter, which is beautiful also. And they, they dry lighter too. I would imagine you'd be like imagining what they'd be yeah. like when they're dry. Everything dries much lighter. Wool uh, dries um, like one or two shades lighter and cotton, linen is really like three shades lighter. Um, this is a sweater that I knit here using all of the yarn that I showed that I had dyed with black tea and um, the carrot tops, except for the pink and purple color. But everything else I dyed at home. So is the yarn white? It's the purple? Yeah. This is a season's worth of dyeing here on the right. Um, at the top are the carrot and radish colors. Uh, then I have dahlia and chives I mix together. Um, the light tan is birch bark from my uh, tree, bark that was on the ground. I didn't take it off the tree. And the ones on the bottom are the, um, the purple iris blossoms. And the sweater on the left, I knit from all of these skeins. And this one right behind you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, recently, I did some more bundle dyeing, but on fabric this time, uh, I used everything from my yard, um, sumac uh, leaves, coreopsis blossoms, black-eyed Susans, and some birch leaves also. Same, uh, bundled it up, tied it. It should have been tighter. I would have gotten more specific outline of the products if I had made it tighter. Um, steamed it, and that's how it came out. And this next one I use mostly red and um, yellow onion skins, also with some of the flowers. 
The end. Fascinating. <laughs> So would anyone like to ask any questions? I'm, I'm finding this so riveting, not only because it's beautiful and a feast for the eyes, but because getting underneath where all of this comes from is so, wait, we're getting a surprise. What are you pulling out? Hi, hi, uh, these, are, these are the shades that um, I've dyed in the last week. So from one Friday to the next, you never know what's going to show up. But Beth and I use a lot of the same materials. And those are, all, those are all done with plants? These are all done with plants. Wow, so can you identify which is which? Sure, sure. So this is a kutch here, which is my new favorite. I was expecting a yellow, um, and it, it came out in this, this really beautiful color. What did you color. say is the name of it? Kutch. Kutch or kutch. C-U-T-H-C. OK. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I had an extra C. Um, and then this here is Quebrejo. Um, I'm saying that correctly. Yeah. yeah. It's Latin, yes. Yeah. So this can produce a much richer pink or red that we see in a lot of the, the Central and South American textiles. Um, Cochinal also will create, create a similar color, but it um, is made from a bug. So I, I avoid that one as much. Um, oh, yeah, coach, cochineal. Cochineal. Yeah. 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 And do, then you, the, do you guys all know what that is? It's a bug that produces a really, really bright red dye. And the bug is shiny and hard. It has a very hard carapace. And you, you can crush it up, and then um, they collect it from the bottom of cacti. So now they have these greenhouses where they collect the larva. And, uh, it's grown on cacti. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and I guess snails are also a source of yeah. purple, which is why purple was a regal color for so many years. I heard that it took. 12,000 snails just to dye the trim of one king's robe. Mm -hmm. So that's why purple was such a, a regal color, apparently. But Oh, uh, my good factoid. Uh, this is a rhubarb. Um, and then the difference here, interestingly, so with the brighter gold here, uh, I did a, a mordant with uh, simplocos, uh, simplocos, that which is a plant that has produces the same effect as aluminum, but it's a little bit gentler on the fabric. And then the uh, untreated fiber actually came out with more of a, a golden color. Mm -hmm. So it's like Beth was saying, you never know exactly what you're going to get. So, so this is more intense. Yes, yes. I was expecting the opposite. Yeah. I thought I'd get darker, um, and it was much brighter. Um, but this is its just sort of the, the experimentation is really fun. Yeah. Like I start a different color almost every day, and um, Beth will send me her results, and she has different techniques, and some things don't work. <laughs> Um, it's, I usually will do uh, a, a sweater for most of ours takes between six and eight skeins. So I'll usually do a minimum or I usually do double that so that we can do at least a couple sweaters. So, so it's tricky, like the, the blue sweater you see there, I made enough to do two sweaters and then we had six colorways. So when we say like small batch, it literally, you, you either have to get that sweater or the next one because so repeating it. Not exactly, because um, even the difference between a steel pan, I use an aluminum pan, um, creates a difference in the color, the, the water, water temperature, um, so many different things. And, and interestingly, that's why synthetic colors became so popular, which are quite harmful, was because, again, the gap wants 10 million units of something. It, it all needs to be the same red, and that sort of takes me back to my childhood of sitting in my mom's showroom and Nordstrom's calling to complain that the red came in and didn't match the red that they saw and they all needed to be shipped back. You know, So this is just sort of the mass fashion. Um, so in, when people come in and shop for a natural dye piece, we do say it's a living garment. And not only is it difficult to standardize, it, it will change over time. So if you leave it in the direct sunlight, you're going to see some, some change. And um, I happen to adore that, but, but not everyone is expecting that. Yeah. So. I actually read a book a long time ago that described how the search for a synthetic quinine, this is of course during the British um, invasion and occupation of India, they were beset with malaria and they were looking for qui a quinine source that didn't necessitate going all the way to South America and getting it from the cinchona plant. So British and German scientists were both trying to synthesize quinine, 
And they, one of the things that they came up with was a product that became Moveline, Mauve, mauve being one of the very first synthetic colors to exist, that purplish red. And one other thing that they came up with accidentally in this quest was acetone. And because the British were not particularly interested in applied science, they didn't do anything with the acetone after it had been accidentally discovered or invented. And German scientists put it in their V-bombs and bombed England with it later. So, I mean, the synthetics, yes, they have quite a <laughs> complicated history. And anyway, sorry, that's a digression, but rather interesting. Thank you. <laughs> he just said that's uplifting. <laughs> but it is it's so interesting to think about. Um, I mean, the more I'm looking at, the more I look, saw both of your slides, the more I heard you talk, the deeper and deeper and deeper this whole thing feels. Like the experience, you've just deepened this experience so dramatically, for me at least. And um, I'm thinking too, like the, I'm seeing a little bit as happened to me with the show upstairs, I'm seeing these garments differently than I would have seen them if I hadn't been exposed to more about their history, more about your involvement. Just as going to the, see the show again and again and again, I'm seeing the surfaces of the work so differently, which is because it's so different from painting anyway. So, but it's, it's all becoming an incredibly deep um, experience with textiles, with fabrics, with our own history too, because it's certainly our our growth as a population, our impatience with service and having things instantly. I mean, all of our development reflects all of that, and this seems like a tremendous antidote to that, especially I, I do remember passing by your story before I went into it mm -hmm. and thinking like, mind offline, mind offline, <laughs> What does that mean? Oh, mind offline, I remember that. <laughs> but I mean, just to, to be able to get back to that and the whole idea of you instantly almost being drawn back into a certain kind of maker mentality, which is so satisfying and meditative, certainly. Um, haven't you all experienced that? Eric. I'm just curious if, uh, if you've noticed that you're I'm curious if you've noticed that uh, your clients are all looking for one-offs or you know small batch kind of stuff, and if that's an expanding market, actually. Yeah. Yeah. The, interestingly, um, I just had a conversation today with the the knitters about this concept of custom garment um, for for knits anyway, and um, we had one gentleman that came in. I met him at a market, and he said, I really like this, but my wife's a knitwear designer. Could you do it in my dimensions? And these are the colors I want. And it was, it was a very scary task because the, it, it's an investment to knit, knit these pieces, even if I'm not the one doing the knitting. Um, it's, you know, 20 plus hours for that knitter. And then we were garment dyeing, so we dye it after it's already been customized for him. And so the, I remember the first day I was um, putting, put it off forever and uh, finally got through it, and he, he loved it. And then he's ordered three more. So he... Um, respected the, the texture of the Cotswold and um, so we're actually moving more towards that where we'll have one or two of each piece and Madeline and I are going to sit down tomorrow to talk about her collection and um, you know the, the pieces that I bought are one size but they not, might not work for everyone but that someone could come in and really ask for the shape and, and dimensions and styling that, that works for their lifestyle um, and I do think there's a trend in that direction and I'm cautiously optimistic because my mom had a custom swimwear line that went out of business, but <laughs> the interesting thing about um, wool is that I, I feel like even if the sweater didn't work for that customer, there, there is another customer that it could work for, and it, and it stores and lasts so long. And is your mom making wool swimsuits? No, but that's something I want to do, wool wetsuits, I really do. Um, I, I have to question my sanity, but I know that people used to swim in wool. So, Actually, uh, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about Shackleton exploring the South Pole yeah. and having survived. I don't know if you've all read Shackleton or books about Shackleton. I highly recommend The Endurance by Carol and Alexander, which is one of the most mind-blowing books you can possibly read. But they were all, 
And of course, his feat has been attempted by people with very advanced Gore-Tex or whatever. Yeah. And they haven't done any better than he did. And they were all wearing woolen underwear mm -hmm. and survived. I mean, literally everybody. So it's not going to be a sad book um, when you read it with pleasure. <laughs> but um, everyone survived. And I, I, I started fantasizing when you were talking before about, I wonder if it had something to do with the antimicrobial properties of lanolin. And I mean, that's, do you all know that you don't have to actually use soap when you wash a sweater because the lanolin actually cleanses itself? Like once air hits it, it, it has natural deodorant and antimicrobial. I don't know. It's fascinating. I just don't think we know enough about the stuff <laughs> that we all refer to. Go ahead, get your mic. The properties of wool are amazing. Yeah, it's the antimicrobial, like you said, the lanolin is naturally waterproof. Um, and then even when it does get wet, wool, wool is water resistant. Even when it does get wet, it still has uh, all of the insulating properties. So that's how those guys, you know, were able to survive too. But um, and flame retardant too, right? Yeah, <laughs> flame retardant, right. I don't know if when you were, if you were like diving 80 or 90 feet underwater, whether it might not pick up a little weight. Yeah, a little soggy. <laughs> it, it would try to be water resistant, but there might be a problem there. I, I thought about that when the, this whole surfing element, but again, in surfing, you're mostly on above the water if, if you're having a good day. <laughs> so um, I've, I've thought about experimenting with it, but it, it, you raise another interesting point um, that really shook my awareness is our skin absorbs so much. And there was this huge shift towards synthetics and um, workout wear and active wear. And, and you know, today we still see that that, that is um, you know, the, the preference of a lot of people to wear a lot of synthetic. And you're absorbing that throughout your body and all of the chemicals that those, those garments were treated with. And you can be so mindful of what you're eating and what you're drinking and the air that you're ingesting. And yet, all day long, you're absorbing it, whether it's through your bed linens or your clothing. And, um, you know, it going right into your glands and, and things like that. So I think from a health perspective, going going back to the less treated fabrics and less processed fabrics in the same way we did with food will we'll have a difference in health. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend washing your sweaters? Uh, I, Beth may have a different technique. I usually use um, like a Castile soap, a pH balance, very gentle soap, and I'll do room temperature water. I'll let it soak for a bit and then just do a, a gentle agitation by hand. I might repeat that a couple times until so you see the water run clear. Careful not to switch too quickly between hot and cold because that can result in felting or shrinkage. And then um, I'll do a technique called blocking where you lay it out almost on a grid and, and there's actually grids that you can buy to, to pin the garment down to reshape it. And what's amazing about wool is that it will go in cotton as well, will go right back into their original form. So if you have a sweater that got hung too long or got misshapen somehow, it will snap back and, and look incredible. And um, through our knitting circle, we also talked about the fact that if you block anything you knit, it actually looks better. <laughs> so you can instantly improve the quality of your knitting through that same technique. Yeah, yeah, all air dried or a super absorbent towel. They they have they sell super absorbent ones, but um I don't know if this I should admit that I do this, but I'll like put another towel on it and then I'll walk on it. <laughs> yeah. Just very carefully. I roll them up and walk on it. Yeah. And also um, it's re really recommended that you not wash the sweaters often, like maybe once a year is it because um, it's really not needed, mm -hmm. you know. They do have some somewhat of a self cleaning. And a steamer is a good idea too. Yeah. A steamer sort of activates those properties and then leave it out in the air and mm -hmm. that, I, I hope I'm not misspeaking. No, I do, I use a steamer a lot. I prefer a steamer actually than, than wet blocking. Yeah, I was actually on a tear earlier this year trying to find out like, I, I just didn't want to use, I didn't want to go to the dry cleaner anymore. I just thought, yeah. ew, what am I doing? And then they give you plastic. You can beg. <laughs> you can give them a bag. And they'll be like, nope, I have to use my plastic. But don't worry. It's better than most plastic. And that usually means that it's not better than anything. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, my background is in textiles. And this is really delightful to see because, I'm sorry, um, it, my background, I was saying, is in textiles. And 
I taught and ran a department at FIT for 20 years and taught at Parsons and worked in industry where everything was commercially dyed and, you know, it, Really, I can tell you it affects your health working in those print plants. And to see these wonderfully subtle colors that are the antithesis of fast fashion, which is really destroying the planet. You know, this, this, mm -hmm. you just buy something, it's so inexpensive, you wear it one season or even less than that and throw it out. And I, I just, this is so, marvelous what I'm looking at, that I just wish there was some way that someday this could be more affordable to more yeah. people. That's because the that's the stumbling block, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, in terms of selling it and producing mm -hmm. it, but it, it's incredibly beautiful. Mm -hmm. I Thank think you. that the, the point about wearing something on your body that can affect you adversely is, is a really good way of waking people up to making other considerations. Mm -hmm. I'll say this as politely as possible. Yeah. And I mean, have you ever like gotten something that was basically plastic based and unwrapped it and it still had that mm -hmm. smell? Mm -hmm. I don't even know what the word, for, I can't think off, of a- Off gassing? Yes, it's off gassing mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, my vet said that that's why my, our cat has hyperthyroidism mm -hmm. because they instituted a law that all fabrics in your home be treated as for flame retardancy. Yeah. And when that started happening, dogs and cats and pets of all kinds, your rabbits would be the same thing, who were exposed to them would develop hyperthyroidism. It used to be unknown before the mid to late 70s when after that had started to become normal. Sorry, that was a digression, but <laughs> not, I mean, you know, if we, if we experiment with animals, mm -hmm. not my favorite thing, um, then, you know, we, would, we should know that, and I'm sure that people do know that, and they just ignore it. Right. I think the, um, the only other talking point I found that has really resonated with people, but um, with regards to the cost, is that I, I had met with someone early on that wanted to help me tell the story of local wool, and... It, it didn't work out because her first comment was, it would be really great if you could figure out a way to produce it, but at half the price. And I said, well, who's, who do we pay less? The, you know, the artisan? Do we pay the farmer? Do we pay the, the miller? All these people are barely making it as it is. Mm -hmm. um, and, we're, and so I said, wouldn't it be better if, if these people that are buying three or four sweaters in a year that they may wear for one or two years considered that they're going to choose a garment that, that's going to last their lifetime and, and maybe can be handed on. And that's a dramatic shift, I think, for most people because shopping continues to be such a sport. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, the, yeah, it's a conflict having a retail store. Like, we're pairing it way back right now because I almost want people to buy way less, <laughs> which is maybe maybe not the right direction to go for business, but that that's a big shift. Um, well, so. it, it'll require a change in yeah. Mm -hmm. It's always the new, new thing, yeah. the next best thing, and yeah. people, you know, feel that, hey, you know, I can afford to wear this even though a year later it's going to be chucked. Mm -hmm. right. So it has to do with a lot of mentality change that's needed as well, I think. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, yeah, it's change of values, yeah. fundamental yeah. values. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think everybody during COVID was thinking, now, now we can see that you know waste is wrong and this is and this and that and pare down and grow your own vegetables and learn to learn to make masks and et cetera. And then, but wait, you wanted something from Amazon, and then more and more and more bad packing materials would arrive, and you're like, ah, oh, they've they've backslid so dramatically but you still wanted that stuff and you yeah. couldn't get it. And it's, it's really, really hard because we are all, let's face it, 1,000% brainwashed by all the companies with whom we come in contact in every form, on ads, online. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in every way. It's really, really hard to make that change happen. And you know, for we humans, it usually takes a catastrophe of some sort, or an emergency, like the Vietnam War, or whatever. But I mean, you, don't, you don't want that to happen, but how else, how else do you shake people out of that feeling? And I'm, I'm totally guilty, you know, I'm yeah. admitting it, yeah, but, you all are. but I, I 
I'm inspired by your concern, like seriously inspired. The, the memory is so short. I mean, here we are two years out of COVID, and we're going back to, hey, man, uh, let's buy some new stuff. Let's do this. I mean, the, the effect of COVID, I think, was, was very short-lived if you look at it on a five- to ten-year basis. It was lived for two years, and you see, you know, in my, my profession, back to the office idea, it initially was a lot of resistance. So we're, we're picking up again, you know, to where we were in 2019. It hasn't really, unfortunately, changed the mentality and the, and the set of values. You know, we thought it would, and then we're back to the old stuff. Well, I mean, I... I think I think peop, you have to give... You have to cut people a little slack if they were feeling like life was a misery and now they get to party a little bit. I understand that, but... Um, I'm just hoping that you're this kind of, the beauty of what you both do, the inspirational kind of foundation of it too, would, I would hope, the better that people know about it. And this is why you're here, and this is why we're doing the church, is to try to get our, all of us to think differently. Mm -hmm. Eric? <coughs> Um, just to elaborate on the, uh, this is why we're here. Now, when we conceived this building, uh, if you look around this floor, this was conceived as a workspace. And it was a workspace for artist residents, maker residents, uh, workshops, things like that. I, I think it's a, it's a, a we're doing a lot of stuff in here, but we haven't quite touched some of the things that I'm passionate about, which is uh, trying to find ways of educating people to the kind of the the creative process, you know, to to the maker process, to the, in getting their mind and bodies active in something that's uh, you know certainly along the lines of what you both do. And uh, so I'm just wondering if, uh, as you sit in this space or something, if you can imagine some programs that we could run out of here for, you know, set periods of time because we want to use it for a variety of things, but something that, you know, whether it's uh, uh, weaving workshops or, or knitting, you know, dyeing, uh, you know, all of the educational things that you both exposed uh, we in the audience to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that, I we, think. You know what, I mean, what would be ideal would be that we could figure out how to gobble up every possible available space in Sag Harbor <laughs> and turn it into precisely what you just said, that the whole town could become a vibrant maker environment, so. I think this is population is the problem. Yeah. Can it grow if it's being educated people? So at least when they do go to the combined fast fashion, they're they're conscious of it and maybe mm -hmm. they'll buy less uh marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's, I'm sorry.
Yeah, COVID was great for makers, absolutely. Yeah. The whole knitting community was, wow, this is our time, you know, and Instagram lit up for knitters, and I learned so much and gained so much. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was fantastic, yeah, it was perfect for that. I would add, add also to that uh, the importance of starting with the children, um, mm -hmm. because yeah, in the I, schools. I started in Montessori, my children started, first they were at Ross, then they went to Waldorf, but the, just this concept of what is this made out of, what is this material, um, and for their parents to model that for them at home. And um, learning to make, you know, yeah. knitting, and it yeah. just does, doesn't exist. I think it used to in Europe more, but here, teaching knitting or in, in school sewing. Well, that's that's also our value system because if people if people valued art, if people yeah. valued their connection with their hands, and if there weren't this stupid idea that it's just for people with talent, it's mm -hmm. just like what is that? And it's lack ridiculous. Of funding, lack of that's yeah. the funding that's always cut first. Yeah. Is, you know. There's a there's a guy upstairs named Markel Shansky who did these fantastic. Um, needlepoint. Needlepoint, thank you. Mm. And the way that he learned them was he was sitting in a bar with a bunch of friends, and one of the guys that he was sitting around with said that he was doing needlepoint, and it was really fun, and he decided to try it, and he's really good at it. It's crazy beautiful mm. art that he makes. Modest scale, but like fantastic. Mm. And, you know, just... Of course, he probably never had thought of it in his life, but to make those things available to children mm -hmm. when they're really little, beyond important. It's just like learning a language. If you understand, mm -hmm. if you remember how good it feels to do something with your hands and how satisfying it is and how the world goes away and you're chill and it's meditative, well, you, you wouldn't think that when you're five, but you know, all of that is just such great positive reinforcement, but we don't have a society that values art education right. in this country. It's crazy. Or craft I, education. I was just going to say that sailors, you know, a century ago, were great lace makers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they had these long trips, and, you know, that's what they did. But I think for children, you know, maybe because I, I come from a teaching background, for children to have workshops where they could dye yarn, dye their own fabric. It would be like magic yeah. to take berries or tea or whatever and see it, you know, change into other colors. Yeah. I think those are incredible workshops too. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we just we just we're still kinda young, honey. Yeah, yeah, that's what you like. So, so Peter Solo was the great art teacher who just recently retired. Everyone should grin from Pearson, but go on. Well, there's a profound irony uh, here. Uh, we're talking about education, and your store is at the corner of Germain and Hampton Street, and about probably 300 yards away there is a captive audience of 500 students who are totally, and I was unaware. Uh, I've been through, past your store a million times and I'm oblivious to everything, so I just would go past it. Um, but the point is that uh, I would imagine that almost all the students are unaware that this even existed and there is a possibility and there is an opportunity and there is funding to bring what you guys are doing into the school. Yeah? Yeah, it's available. Yeah, it's, it, we had, a, we had t some yes, interest. We some, had some yeah. students from Pearson uh, oh, that cool. were coming in. One young woman, Cleo Hallwell, is going to start teaching a, a teen knitting circle because it just they all came in and the 13-year-olds would sit on the floor and teach each other to knit. Um, but it, I, I agree, my kids are now at Sag Harbor um, Elementary and I recognize some of the families, but there, there's um, definitely a, two different uh, paths that people are on. Some people want to come in and sort of leave their kids for a bit and come back and, and not, but I found that when the parents are involved in the class, the children actually stick with it even more. Yeah. So, so that was. No, and I, I think what, a, uh, what Eric said was really important, which is that uh, 
what can benefit the, the you know, this community, I think the students, the kids here mo most, is a hands-on experience making things. Yeah. And um, I think it can have a profound benefit not only on them, but the entire community. Do you think? Find a way to do something that's productive enough that the kids don't have to leave. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's some, oh. some experience that keeps it into a, yeah. a kind of uh, industry of some kind where oh. their talents are put to use and, you know, make it up. Do you think the funding is, uh, is there any um, differentiation between funding for fine art versus craft because that's always like um, you know working with what we're doing is is well, not one, considered fine art. I mean mentioned is that you know all of you went to art school, mm -hmm. so no, well not me, yeah. mostly <laughs> art school. Yeah. Um, so what I'm saying is that uh, I don't think that there would be an issue with differentiation. I don't think there would be. Uh, an objection, a differentiation mm -hmm. between, let's say, applied art or like text, you know, textiles, this kind of thing, and uh, th things like painting and drawing, mm -hmm. or or something like that. I'm I'm pretty confident of that since I sort of control. <laughs> well, I've I've been an art teacher for my whole career and um, at all all levels, but when I did teach elementary children, I got them involved in in fiber arts and um, in different ways, but the weaving was really rewarding and I found that by introducing it in a really minimal way when they were very young, like kindergarten, and then you know a little bit more in first, by the time they were in third grade, they just loved it and um, it also was you know very universal, like boys just loved it and I would offer the like the opportunity to come in when they had lunch and I'd have the room full of these kids weaving when we were doing it and um, it was what they'd produce was beautiful you know and then I did classes with needlepoint and um, you know I didn't do knitting because other other teachers did that but you know I think the fiber arts is really important mm -hmm. they're learning the the physics and the mathematics and yeah. that, you know, there's so, so many other mm -hmm. things that they're they're picking up. Um, well, you know, and, and you, you're going to teach them algorithms too. <laughs> <laughs> when you were talking about that, I was like, what? Sequence. <laughs> Sequence. Sequence. Simple ones, but it, um, yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I, my other career has been in seeking out patterns and being able to find patterns in large data sets. And so I, I find it interesting that now I'm drawn to people that create patterns, you know, yes. so that I, I love working with people that are far more creative than I am and finding ways to. Does anyone have any, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Just, uh, Last question. Are you then interested in like this emerging story coming out about uh, Babbage and, uh, and um, uh, Lovelace, uh, you know, the difference engine, the, the original computer which went into the Jacquard loom, you know, right? You, that's not on your radar there? I, I I feel like only only the surface right. surface cool part stuff. of it. I'll right. I'll, I'll dig yeah. into that. Yeah, I've I've been personally digging into my story and and the, the two schools that were involved. It's a very unique phenomena happened from these two groups of the students. They that were pushed online early, and uh, you know everything was done to to benefit us at the time. But it was. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of interesting stuff that happened. Do you all know yeah. what they're talking about? No, I, can I, I, explain can you a little bit. The it came up with the original uh, idea of a of a computer in the 1830s, mm -hmm. maybe 40s. Um, if it had gotten funded, it would have been we'd been le be living the, the the steampunk world right now. Uh, Ada Love, I, Ida Ada Lovelace, do it right. Mm -hmm. yes. Byron's Lord Byron's Byron. daughter.
Um, she, her she mother. Was, she was. Uh, she was Byron's daughter, and uh, Byron's mother taught her mathematics, or had her taught mathematics, in order to avoid her uh, going mad like her father. So, um, and she was an extremely astute mathematician, and helped move the Babbage machine forward doing extraordinary work. And that fed into, you're right, the Jacquard loom, which was the first binary system because the Jacquard looms were looms with a, it was like a, a small wooden cartridge and it either had a, a point where a needle could go through or it didn't. So it was a zero or one game. So it's the first binary mechanical system. And that's how they did all of the really extraordinary um, weaving of damask silks with very intricate patterns. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a rather extraordinary meeting of poetry, mathematics, and industry, because the Jacquard loom, I mean, the um, Kiki Smith tapestry upstairs was woven on a, on a Jacquard loom. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> April, uh, just to the point that was made on education, uh, there is uh, Joyce Raimondo, if you're familiar with her, she does the uh, art classes, painting with kids, and that may be some some something that could be considered here at the church. Thank you. Well, I, you know, I love that we're, I, I feel like we're all so part of this institution right now. It's just making me like beside myself with joy because I love discussions like this and I we love input. So we definitely welcome any more suggestions and talk and references and expertise that we that people might be willing to volunteer and help with and i you know i know it's getting late but i just want to thank you so much because i think this is one of the most interesting talks ever it's thank just you been great. thank you